I want to finish the series tonight on the 16 essentials to make you a better soul winner. And I want to speak to you on Jeremiah, when God called Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said, well, I I can't speak. I, I don't know how to talk. And I find if there's anything that discourages Christians and soul winners, it's they're going back and they don't get the results they should get. And a lot of people say, well, I'd like to be a soul winner, but I can't say anything. I don't know what to say. But look what the Lord told Jeremiah. I'm glad that this is in the book. Uh, When the Lord spoke to Jeremiah, and he said, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. And be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Now, folks, as a soul winner, you don't have everything cut and dry. You have to go under the leadership and the direction of the Holy Spirit. I don't say, well, I know what I'm going to say when I get in this home, because I don't. If they're a backslider, then certainly God's going to give me the wisdom to deal with a backslider. If they're an unsaved man, woman, boy, or girl, he'll give me the wisdom to deal with that unsaved person. That's like somebody reading their prayer. There's no power in that. There's no power in reading of a prayer. And the same way when you're going out soul winning, you go out depending fully upon the Lord, and he'll put the words in your mouth. Some of the greatest soul winners I've ever known couldn't hardly speak a word. And yet God used them. And they became the best soul winners that you've ever seen. Now, soul winners should go in twos, but only one do the talking. And the other one, babysit, turn off televisions, and so on. Now, folks, that second man is very important. We don't realize that, but that second man is just as important as the first man. I had a fellow out with me not too long ago, and I asked him to go with me on visitation when I was in Florida. I had a different man every night to go visited with me. And he said, Preacher, I want to go with you. I've been trying for a year and a half to go visiting with you. But I had a different man every night. So I said, All right, you go with me. So on Tuesday night, he was there, and he got out of his car and had a great big old family Bible. I said, Man, where are you going? He said, I'm going visiting with you. I said, Well, let's just take a little testimony. I said, man, you're going out among the wolves. And I said, if they see you coming, I said, they're going to attack you. And the Bible says to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Now, you need to carry a New Testament. Keep it out of sight. Don't go with a big old family Bible. And so he said, okay, preacher. So I went out visiting that night and had this family just about ready to accept the Lord, just pulling the net in, and he collected coins. And I said, with our heads bowed, uh, would you folks invite the Lord Jesus to come in your heart and save you? And this fellow said, "Uh, Pastor, could I say something? I said, yes, go right ahead. He said, do you folks collect coins? (laughs) Man, listen, it just throwed throwed water on the fire. Now, folks, listen, when you're out for business and soul winning, you need to keep your mind centered on getting that family saved. And don't go and discuss ball games, discuss uh, coins, or discuss anything else. When an insurance man comes to your home, he's there to discuss insurance. And when you go in the home, you're there to discuss insurance. That's accepting the Lord as their Savior. Go there for business and, and don't get sidetracked in something else. Now, one person needs to do the talking, but the other one do the praying. I was out visiting here a few weeks ago, and I had a fella. Uh, with me, and uh, he was acting as a second man, and they had a little French poodle dog there, and this fella had heard me talking about on the soul winning, what he's supposed to do, his responsibility, so this little uh, poodle dog was barking. Now, instead of him picking that dog up and going outside with it, he was sitting in the chair, and he looked down at that dog, and he said, shh, <laughs> well, man, that's sick him to a dog. And that dog started barking, and I got tickled. I couldn't lead that family to the Lord. I just, I just got up and walked out of there because he was actually uh, saying sick him to that dog. Well, listen, folks, that was a lack of wisdom. Now, we need to have wisdom when we're talking to people about the Lord. I remember 
uh, when Dr. Rollins and I were out making a call one day, now he probably don't remember this, we was dealing with this family, and, and they had about five boys, and they started coming through the living room, they was playing cowboy, and they were shooting each other, and part of them were Indians and part of them cowboys. Well, I said, I've got to get these kids out of here. Brother Rollins never lead that family to the Lord. And so I asked those kids to go outside. I went outside with them, and we started playing marbles together. I put some marbles in a ring while Dr. Rollins was leading that family to the Lord. I didn't think he'd ever get them saved. I really didn't. My knuckle was hurting and everything else. But, <laughs> but we were out there playing marbles, and, and people driving by, and there's some of them scratching their head and shaking their head. And I know they said, there's a nut out there. But, folks, there was a family that was being saved inside, and it was worth it all. Now listen, in order to be a soul winner, you need to go and realize and recognize that that second man is just as important as that first man. I felt honored to act as a second man while he was acting as first man. Now there's been times that I was acting as first man, he's acted as second man. But it's in the eyes of God, one's just as important as the other because the Bible says that we'll be rewarded together. And there's not room for jealousy in soul winning. There's not room for jealousy in soul winning. When you go soul winning, you say, I'll do whatever's necessary. So uh, be sure that one does the talk and the other one to pray. Now, let me show you something else. A soul winner goes with a means of getting the prospect lost. Now, you'll never get a person saved until you get them lost. And you'd be surprised at the people that never drank, cuss, smoked, chewed, dip. They don't do anything, period. And so they think they're all right. Now, you've got to get that person lost before you can ever get them saved. Like a person out here drowning, they're not going to holler for help until they're going under the third time. And you've got to get a person to realize and recognize that their good works will not get them to heaven, and their holding on will not get them to heaven. They're going to have to be born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb, and the Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 3.23, then take them to Romans 6.23, where the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you must get the prospect lost before you can get them saved. And if necessary, take your prospect out to them. The best way to deal with a businessman is take them out for a dinner. I had a friend of mine in New York. I was there in a revival meeting, and he had a businessman, and he said, uh, Preacher, we need to go see him. And I said, let's invite him out to dinner. And so he called him, and I said, let's buy him the best steak he can eat. We took him to the steakhouse, and there before we had the steak, uh, this pastor asked if I would lead in prayer, and I did. And I prayed, and I preached in that prayer. And then I said, Lord, I pray that this man will see Christ in me and in this other preacher. And I pray that this man will see that what we have is wonderful and he'll want what we have. As soon as I got through praying, I prayed God's blessings upon him. And as soon as I got through and I looked over and the tears was in his eyes and he said, uh, I've never been prayed for like that. I've never been prayed for like that. He said, I believe you fellas have something that I need. You know what? And I had to have some wisdom. You don't deal with a businessman like you do a farm boy. They're all different. Jesus didn't. He didn't approach everybody the same way. And you don't deal with a businessman like you do some fellow out here behind a plow. And so uh, this man said, I need what you fellas have. I said, sir, let's have our steak. And just as soon as we eat our steak, I'd like to show you what we have. Now, I could have gone ahead and led him to the Lord before we eat our steak, but I knew I was dealing with a businessman, and I don't like cold steak, and I'm sure he didn't. And so as soon as we got through, I led him to Christ, and he was thrilled about it. Now, because of that prayer that got to his heart, I heard a man behind me. I heard him talking about 11 hours to live. And I kept listening to that until finally I had to go find out what he's talking about. So I went around behind the table and I said, Sir, uh, excuse me, let me introduce myself. I introduced myself to him and I said, I heard, overheard you talking about 11 hours to live. I said, Do you know someone that's only got 11 hours to live? And he said, Well, he said, I'm that man. He said, I had 11 hours to live. And I said, What happened? He said, Open heart surgery. 
I said, how long ago has that been? He said, it's been about 11 months. I said, sir, let me ask you a question. What were you thinking about, not on the first hour, not on the second hour, but the 11th hour, what were you thinking about? He said, I really don't know. I said, weren't you thinking about spending eternity? Where are you going to spend eternity? He said, no, I never given any thought. He said, I thought about my family. Now, everything he'd say, the Lord had to give me wisdom what to say next. I said, sir, have you ever taken the time to stop and thank the Lord for letting you live? He said, well, uh, no. He said, the, the priest came in and gave me my last rites, and he said everything was all right. I said, sir, now, now I'm not saying anything about that. I'm saying what the Bible says, that it's not the priest, it's not the preacher, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I said, would you allow me to have prayer right here and thank God for letting you live? Would you let me do that? He said, would you do it? And I said, yes, sir. We bowed our head, and I thank the Lord for letting that man live. I said, Lord, you've given this man 11 months that he didn't deserve. And I want to take the, this opportunity to thank you for that 11 months. And I pray he'll recognize that. And he won't lean on being a Baptist. He won't lean on being a Catholic. But he'll lean on accepting Jesus as his Savior. As soon as I got through, this man was sobbing with tears, and he said, he said, Sir, I want to get saved. There in that restaurant, I led him to Christ, and the next night in the meeting, he brought his wife, and his wife was saved, and his wife's brother was a police officer, and he got saved. And the next night, we had the chief of police saved, and we had the president of a bank saved, and two other deputy sheriffs saved, all through what? praying for that man, and all through having that businessman out for a steak dinner. Let me ask you, was it worth it? Sure, it's worth it if you have to borrow the money, but if necessary, take your prospect out for dinner or any way to get them saved. And if necessary, write them a letter. I don't have the time to tell you of testimony after testimony of people that have been saved through the writing of a letter. I'll just tell you briefly of a, a lady that was so burdened for her father. And she was a soul winner, won a lot of people to the Lord, built a bus route from nothing to 99, her and her husband. She came crying one day and said, Preacher, I can't even get my own father saved. And said, I'd, do, I'd give anything if I could get him saved. And I said, write him a love letter. And she wrote him a love letter and said to Dad, I want to write and tell you how that I love you and how that I appreciate you. And when I had polio as a little baby and you put your arms around me and cared for me when nobody loved me. And Daddy, you're the best daddy anybody could have. And I love you, Daddy, with all my heart. Waited two weeks and I said, let's write another letter. And she wrote another letter to her father. And that love letter was from the Lord. She wrote that letter and said, Daddy, the letter I wrote you about uh, your being my dad and how that I love you and appreciate you, but Daddy, I want to tell you someone else that loved you more than I ever loved you. He loved you enough to die for you. He loved you enough he was buried for you. He arose for you, and he's coming back. He wants to take you with him, Daddy, and his name's Jesus. Will you accept him as your Lord and Savior, Romans ten thirteen? Waited a few weeks, and she came to the office crying her heart out and said, Pastor, i got to talk to you. And I said, What's wrong? And it came in the office, and she was in a wheelchair. Her husband brought her in, and she said, Read this letter. I read the letter, and the father said, Daughter, I appreciate the first letter of how that you love me and appreciate me, and I want you to know that I still love you as my daughter. But uh, I want to tell you the last letter meant more than the first letter because I got saved. Oh, listen, if necessary, write your prospect a letter and always take them out for lunch, whatever's necessary to get them saved. And then let me say this to a soul winner, always keep tracks with you. Always. We were talking here tonight about the many testimonies we've heard this week of people that's been saved through the track ministry. Time would not permit of all the people I know that's been saved through the track ministry. When I was pastoring in Florida, when I was working here or other places, when I go to the hospital, I leave tracks everywhere. And I remember this one fellow, he came and got on the elevator, and 
I handed him a track. I'd put one in the phone booth, one behind the ashtray. And this fella got on the elevator, and I handed him a track. He said, my, my. He said, I pulled in the parking lot. I noticed the name of that church and the pastor's name. I had a bumper sticker on it. He said, I went in the phone booth to call my wife, and I found the track. I went to put my cigarette out. I found the track. I get on the elevator, and you hand me a track. He said, what's going on out there? I said, I don't know. I'm the pastor. (laughs) I said, all I know is you need to be saved. And he said, I sure do. And through that track, he got under conviction. Now, always when I get on the elevator, I drop a track on the elevator. Somebody's got to clean it up. Somebody's got to see it. I remember one day that one I throwed one on that had the simple plan, had my picture on it like Dr. Rollins. I was proud of me like he is. And so, <laughs> uh, so I, I dropped that on the... Man, that's great. I appreciate that. So I dropped that on the elevator. And this uh, Negro lady, she got on there and she picked that up and she said, hmm. She said, somebody throwing what I got around. And she picked it up, you know, and she looked at that, and she looked at all that picture, and she looked up at me, and she looked back down, and she looked up again, and she said, that you ain't. And I said, yeah, that's me. She said, you're not throwing word of God around, are you? And I said, no, I was hoping you'd take that and get saved. And she said, I sure need the Lord. I sure need the Lord. We got off the elevator, and it was through that track that that dear lady accepted the Lord as her Savior. Now, folks, you are to always keep tracks on you, and everywhere you go, pass them out. I mean, I never get up in the morning, the first thing I do is put tracks in my pocket. In every pocket, there's tracks. And the fact of it is, I've even thought about putting them in my pajamas and sleep with them. I just, I believe in the track ministry. I could give testimony after testimony of people that's been saved. Some of you ladies, where you carry that snuff, move that snuff out. And put some tracks in there. And some of you fellows move your cigarettes out of the way and carry some tracks in there and pass them out. I remember a fellow in Miami, Florida. One day I was driving down through, and you know, and I always roll my glass down witness. And so I had a Buick, had those power windows. I was living high on the hog. So I rolled that window down. A fellow pulled up alongside me in a convertible. I said, how you doing? He said, doing all right. I said, boy, it's hot, isn't it? He said, hotter than hell. I said, no, it's not hotter than hell. He said, it is too. I said, no, I got a thermometer that tells you how hot it is in hell. He said, you have, and I said, sure have. I said, pull over and I'll show you how hot it is in hell. And he pulled over, and man, I got out and got in this car, and he said, you mean you got a thermometer that tells how hot it is in hell? I said, I sure have. He said, let's see it. I said, it's in the book of Luke. Here's a man, it's the best, it's the best the you can get, because he said, and I'm in torment. And through that, that that man accept the Lord. Now, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that a soul winner are to always be on the lookout to witness. Passing out tracks, talking to people, stopping them on the street. I was in the hospital making some calls one day, and a nun was in the store there. And I went in to get some mints, and I had three people saved up on the third floor. So I walked in, and I said, had three people saved? And uh, she said, who performed the operation? <laughs> and I, I said, the Lord did. I said, uh, the Lord saved. And I said, where do you go to church? And uh, <laughs> she said, well, she said, I guess you know I'm, I'm Catholic. I said, no, I didn't know it. She said, you didn't know I was a nun, didn't recognize me? I said, no, I didn't recognize it. You say, well, she thinks you're stupid. Don't make any difference as long as you can witness to her and talk to her about the Lord. I showed her right quick how three people got saved. If I'd introduced myself as Reverend so-and-so, I couldn't have witnessed to that woman. But I just told her about those people getting saved. Now, a soul winner are to always go looking, being soul conscious. Fact of it is, everybody's lost until you check them out. And when you check them out and they give you a good report, I don't ask anybody anymore if they're saved or if they're a Christian that like the color boy. I've been saved four times, and most of them reverends. And so I, I don't ask them anymore. I ask them this, have you really, truly been born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb, but be conscious? 
A lot of people say, well, you can read books that will uh, kindly stimulate you and get you to have a passion for lost souls. Well, I believe in reading books that will give you a passion, but I believe the only way you'll ever have a passion for lost souls is get out on the field. You can't win any wars without fighting the enemy, and you can't win any souls without getting out on the combat and going on the front line with them. The only reason we've won the wars that we've won, it's been because we've been organized and we mobilized and we evangelize. I say to you as a church or as an individual, you'll never evangelize until you get organized and then you can mobilize. And these soul consciences, everybody that you come in contact with, they're lost until you find out where they stand. Now, let me say this, especially to a young Christian. You go out on the field, you're going into combat. In fact, the business of the Bible teaches we're going out among wolves. And wolves are out to get the sheep. The Bible says, oh, we lack sheep. They've gone astray. Sheep will go astray. And a wolf will attack that little sheep. That's why he said, always depend upon the shepherd to lead you and guide you and direct you. Now, folks, listen, you get discouraged. If you go down through life and you go out here trying to get people saved and keep them out of hell, there'll be moments and there'll be times that you'll be in the valley of discouragement. And this is one trick of the devil. If he can get you discouraged and get you to quit, he's won the battle. So I say to you, not get discouraged. Don't be afraid of their faces. Go out. I'm not afraid whoever I come in contact with. I go and say, Lord, I'm depending fully upon you because every person I look into their eyes, they're going to spend eternity somewhere. And so we need to be soul conscious. The reason many people are not winning anybody to Christ is because they're not soul conscious. You talk to a businessman, but do you stop and ask him where he's going to spend eternity? When you talk to a person in the grocery store somewhere else, do you take the time to find out where they're going to spend eternity? Oh, listen, the Lord tells us to always be soul conscious. I believe soul winners ought to be on the lookout all the time trying to find new approaches to approach people. I'm always looking for some way to get in this home or to approach this man or this family about the Lord. Like that businessman and like the man that was talking about 11 hours to live. Well, it was really, you say it's none of your business. It was my business. It was my business because I overheard him and I went back and because I took that opportunity to go around, I was so conscious. Went around there, and I don't know how many was saved through that. I think six or seven people that accepted the Lord as their Savior. And this preacher friend of mine uh, wrote me just a few weeks ago, and this president of the bank, nobody had ever been able to reach him, but because of the family getting saved, and he wanted to come see him baptized, and he got saved. Now, folks, listen, that's why it's very necessary as a soul winner to be soul conscious. Everybody you come in contact with are not Christians. They may spend eternity in a devil's hell. Whatever you do, always remember one thing. Let the shepherd lead the sheep. Father, we pray you'll bless this message today. May those that listen apply it to their own hearts and say, Lord, help me to be a better soul winner. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. In your name we pray. Amen.